for the cartography group on our layout, we have already allotted on the uh, layout in the GIS file in the MXD an area of 11 by 17, and currently that's in portrait. We can accommodate that space in landscape, but we lose a little bit of the area of the uh, map layout to have for the description of map unit legend entry. And part of that's because that 11 by 17 won't go all the way to the edge. And we would put it as the description of map units, the correlation of map units, and then the cross section. But the correlation of map units is going to have a gap over here that's kind of empty. So likely we'll center that underneath the DMU and cross section. And that means that space that we won't be able to utilize um, in the DMU legend. And and um, the, the better you can synthesize your DMU data table for short description uh, might allow us to utilize that space the best. So uh, one of the things to keep in mind is, yeah, the description of map units data table um, has the description and the short description field. And the description field can be as verbose as you want. And the short description should be just the bare bones minimum of describing the unit for identification purposes. It should be the bare bones description of the unit um, so that we can actually get, uh, if you've got hundred of un hundreds of units, that short description is all we're going to be able to try and fit on the layout. Uh, because of the volume of units. So that's one of the things to keep in mind. Um, one of the other things about the correlation of map units is that uh, we try and make the boxes half an inch wide at 1 to 24,000. And what that translates to is 1,000 feet at 1 to 24,000 or 304.8 meters at 1 to 24K. And everyone uh, instantly comments, but this isn't a spatial data table. And you're correct, it's not. It doesn't have to be. But the reason why we do it spatially is when we're running through the map and we're getting ready to export everything, it's easy if everything is set and zoomed to the 1 to 24K extent of the layout. Uh, this allows and prevents us from inadvertently making it weird sizes. And then it also allows us to set the size of the boxes uh, more uh, explicitly. Otherwise, it'll be so dependent on the scale that you digitize it on it, digitize the correlation of map units at. And we may not have that. We may not know what you digitized it at to make it half an inch wide. So, um, this allows us a quick reference so we can look up here in the um, map scale box and look at what it is when we're getting ready to export. Uh, it assists the team greatly in being able to do this fast. And what that translates to is that I dropped the raster for uh, Selden Canyon's correlation of map units in here. And currently, it's not geo-referenced. So if we take a measurement on this, it's going to be a weird size because of the very nature of it. So it's, well, it's an unknown unit it's because I haven't set the coordinate system. Um, but the, the, we have no control over this effectively. And uh, the other factor that uh, uh, you may want to consider when doing this is this was done by hand. You can also do this in Excel and give yourself some consistent box sizes for each of your units, give you the ability to set up your columns and give you the ability to set up the spacing in between each of your units. Um, so if you're digitizing this by hand yourself, uh, you can organize it in a much tidier way uh, that way. And then you can also do the merging of columns and rows and cells and stuff like that in order to span multiple uh, uh, columns if you're uh, placing headings and stuff like that. Uh, so one of the things that um, getting started to get this georeferenced seems problematic at first. Most people kind of balk of what do you georeference this to? And it doesn't matter what you georeference this to. But if you go ahead and set yourself up with a box, 
at 1 to 24K, that is 11 by 17 or 280 by 432 centimeters, you'll have a box that's roughly the size it's going to be at 24K. So we kind of fake some things in to begin with. And then um, the other discussion point before we start getting this set up is that the correlation of map units drives the description of map units legend. So we approach the layout from a data-driven layout method where the data provides the information. The maps, uh, uh, lines, points, and polygons drive the information that's presented in the DMU legend. And the reason why we do that is a couple of reasons. It allows us to find any missing units, and it allows us to, f on e either side, let me put it that way, it allows us to find missing units in the correlation of map units, and allows us to find missing units in the description of map units. Um, because we set up a join from the correlation of map unit, map unit poly, to the data table for the description of map units. And then any missing unit, we understand that there is a problem. And then we can do that the reciprocity and then find the missing unit on the correlation of map units. Um, I hope that makes sense. Um, that was the initial setup discussion that I wanted to broach because it provides a lot of the context for how uh, particularly I think of things, but how kind of I've been training the team to think of things and how I've coached most of the seasoned geologists on how to do this. Um, it makes for a relatively easy way to digitize. Um, do we care that these are half an inch wide perfectly? N no, but it's really nice when all of our maps look exactly the same. So if you can do that, that would be great. And then we got some compound units here that are showing the or compound boxes that are showing the interrelationship, the inner bedding of the units. And that would become a little difficult as well. So we have to be accommodating for that and um, make sure that we're being reasonable with our expectations. But one of the things we could do with this one is make sure that this part is half an inch wide, this part is half an inch wide, and that part is half an inch wide. That would then set the standard for looking similar or uniform anyway. Um, the other comment to make about this is don't forget that your vertical scale of age can have breaks in it so that you can change the scale so that you can uh, uh, more detailed show the relationship of de deposition. So these are just boxes that aren't tied to any age, but this one tends to show a deposition over a time frame just like these do, whereas the PA and PH do not. So that's one of the things to take in consideration. We should really put in age dates bracketing all deposition uh all, all, to, to not all that the the length of time that deposition was occurring over and if that's not known uh it, it can be kind of extrapolated from your uh age boxes on the left if that makes sense any is that not clear what i'm discussing there I mean, gen generically, we know when the early Paleozoic started. We know when the early Paleozoic ended. Uh, we know when the late Paleozoic started, and we know when the late Paleozoic ended. Does that make sense? So it doesn't have to be a perfect uh, geometry of scale of deposition, but that's kind of what that represents, right? So uh, things that are laterally aligned are syn depositional. And then uh, vertically would be our stratigraphy. Does that make sense? Okay, so one of the things that uh, I'm going to recommend right off the bat is I've noticed that the quad name CMU layer file that I provided many of you has some flaws in it. So what I'm going to recommend is that you go and grab 
the most recent version of that from the 24K quad template map elements arc folder. Um, I'm not sure how that problem developed and uh, how it introduced ourselves into our template, but it did. And unfortunately, I am retroactively correcting that. Uh, but the truth is, is basically the way you can think about quad template you know, on the S drive is that is always the most recent version of what my team is working on. And because we build the templates two years before they're due, that means what I give you or what you deliver to me is already two years out of our method. Um, and we're trying to make that change log shorter every time. So there's less that's happening with every instance. But it is something to consider. You can always come in and grab quad name, quad name CMU, quad name CSX layer files and use those and trust that they'll be the most current version of what we're working from. So I did that and dragged that in here. I'm going to go ahead and right click and repair my data sources to my Selden Canyon geodatabase. And I should also comment uh, as well that one of the best things you can do is set your uh, workspace and scratch environments to speed things up. And I'm worried that I haven't done that yet. So I'm going to go ahead and do that in this project. Um, we're joining to CMU map unit polys. So I'm going to add that. And then while that's fixing all of the links to the CMU feature classes, I'll go ahead and demonstrate the process of coming to geoprocessing environments workspace and set your workspace. So I'm going to change my current workspace from G scratch, which no longer exists on this computer, which is the reason why it took a little bit of time to register to my Selden Canyon geo database. But the catch is, is the first time I'm not just going to go to home. I want to define the explicit path of H, my documents, 24K, S, Selden Canyon, Map Elements, Selden Canyon. And I want to make sure I am explicit with that because I want the H drive letter designation. Because if this goes to the UNC path, ARC 10, in Windows 10 will spin on that for 40 minutes. It'll take forever for it to load. So if you're seeing large times between geoprocessing options of loading, it's because you haven't defined the explicit path. You just have it as a UNC path. And then my scratch drive is now on the D drive. So I'm gonna fix that to go to D, scratch, and then I've got a scratch geodatabase sitting here. For the most part, that isn't that big of a deal. But if you've got a geoprocessing um, tool that writes temporary files that it refers back to later on, you'll want to make sure to save that and do a scratch geodatabase that you can occasionally clear out or delete altogether. Uh, it just uh, gives it a place to write those temporary files that it then either deletes itself a lot of the times, but sometimes they are persistent. So uh, you want this to go to a location that you set and know you can clean out. And then also setting it to the local hard drive in my computer, speed things up because it's then not writing across the network. It's writing just to my hard drive for the scratch stuff. And uh, don't set this to your C drive. Your C drive should be a high speed uh, SSD that has a finite number of writes to it, whereas my D drive is a spinning disk. So it's a little bit slower, but it benefits from uh, not, your operating system um, is faster on the SSD and the HD is local, so it mitigates that speed issue as much as possible. But the SSD allows your software to open and process much faster. So I clicked okay, and now, 
because of the way I did things, I need to set my coordinate system to my NAD 83 zone 13, or 12 if that's the scenario that you're in. Okay, so now I have my CMU. We're going to go ahead and call this Selden Canyon CMU. And with the joints, uh, with the, the links reset back for the data, I'm going to go ahead and save this as a layer file in my Selden Canyon folder as Selden Canyon CMU layer. This way, if something happens, I can just add that back in. Or if I uh, alter the settings for any of my layers, I can go back to the original settings if I want. Okay, in CMU, in the correlation and map units uh, feature data set, let's put it that way. Uh, one of the features that we have at our disposal is the correlation of map units cartographic lines. Um, I'd like everyone to be aware that we're actually having discussions right now in the team about how uh, GEMS handles the correlation of map units, and we may be altering that. Uh, principally, I don't think it's going to alter much. It just may be the name of things gets a little more generic. Um, and I think there is a benefit to that. So uh, while we discuss that amongst ourselves, at some point I'll probably present it to a subset of you and see what you guys think. Um, but just know that, again, everything is fluid, and we're just trying to make the easiest method for you and the easiest method for us. And we're always improving on this. If I didn't improve this process every year, um, it drive me nuts. But we do keep speeding things up, so uh, keep that in mind. But cartographic lines can be strictly lines that are cartographic, or it can be uh, guides and grids to help us digitize. So if I said we had a 11 by 17 area at 1 to 24K, I can go ahead and digitize that in. So I'm going to go to cartographic lines. I'm going to start an editing session and go to cartographic lines. And in cartographic lines, we have leaders and cross section lines. And these aren't, this is one of the things that we're still working on this year for cleaning up. But you could use the leader as a temporary um, box to build your correlation of map units, or you could use the map boundary as a temporary box. It doesn't really matter in the grand scheme of things. And once we've got this geo-referenced, we kind of, it can be deleted. It's just meant to be a box to geo-reference to, to give us an idea of where things are at for our hand-drawn correlation map units, or what you generate in Excel, or if you decide you can go ahead and generate this in AI, but in AI you're gonna do more work. So it's probably better to just go ahead and digitize, make a scratch version that's easy for you to edit is the primary comment uh, because editing here in ARC is harder after the fact than it is in like Excel where you can add a row or add a column or anything like that or in AI where you can just draw another box or on a piece of paper where you can just draw a box. It's things to keep in mind. Uh, editing Adding boxes, shifting boxes in ARC is not as easy as it could be. And I think it's a prime product of the interface of ARC and its editing uh, uh, methods, but um, that is something to keep in mind. The more robust you have this from the beginning, the better off you'll be. And there are some ways that you can make sure that everything that's on the map and everything that's on the cross sections ends up in this by exporting a Excel file of all of your units on the map and all of your units on the cross section and make sure that you have that complete list. That's an easy way to get the list of map units that you need to deal with. So I'm going to do it this way using a leader box. And what I'm going to do is I've done the conversions so that 280, 280 centimeters at 1 to 24K is 6,705.6 meters. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start making my box. Assuming I'm starting at 0, 0. So I can say absolute, go to 0, 0. And this will be in meters because my coordinate system, my CRS is in meters. So if I do that, I instantly have a 0, 0 location. 
And then I can do, and there's a whole bunch of different ways you can do this now. So I'm going to do the method that will help most people, I think, and understand what I'm doing. So I want to lock this horizontally. So if I hit Control A or right click, you can select the direction and make it lock to a direction. So I'm going to lock this to 90 degrees. And now it can only move along that axis, that, that angle. So if you specify an angle, it'll only lock on that angle, angle and the reverse angle. So I can do that. And then I can go ahead and hit F6 or right click and select the absolute. Or I can do a uh, delta XY or direction length. I could have done both of those at the same time where I did a direction and a length, but I want to talk about all the options and kind of give you an idea of what I'm working for. Basically, the direction and length, because we have known direction and lengths, is probably the easiest, but I want to give the overarching concepts of what's happening. So I'm going to do delta x, delta y. Our delta x is what we're changing now, and that's going to be are 11 wide. We'll do a portrait for this one because this is in a portrait format. But if we do 10,363.2 meters, our Y, we aren't going up any. Our Y stays constant. So we do that. We zoom out. And now we can see how the image we loaded in is not at the scale that we're setting it up for. And this is the important part because we can set this to a known scale then being one to 24 K for our one to 24 K maps and know that we have it referenced, right? Giving us the ability to make our boxes the size we want. So we can do a um, control D Delta X, Delta Y. Our Delta X now is zero. We're not moving any, but we're going up. Oh, I did that backwards, didn't I? This is supposed to be 6,000. Don't. Sorry. Forgive me a second. Ah, fine. Okay, and then we're going to do our directional at zero, and then we're going to do our delta x, delta y at 10, 636.2. And we can throw a directional again, or again, we can just go ahead and do a uh, absolute because we know what the absolute is we know that our x absolute is going to be zero and our y absolute is still 10 3 6 3 point 2. how did i mess that up it's because i'm trying to do too many methods and show all of them all at once and I'm going to do my delta x again, oops, my absolute again, and go to 0, 0. But I messed up that point right there, and I'm not sure how. Ah. Did I type it in badly over here? I bet I typed it in badly over here. Yeah, I typed in 63 sticks instead of 363. Forgive my dyscalculia. Yep, 636. Six. No, it's 363. Three. 
Okay, so now I have a box. And that box then allows us to at least get a general starting point of our Selden Canyon TIFF and get it geo-referenced. So I'm gonna go ahead and zoom back to that layer. And I'm going to pick this corner to start off with as my um, upper left-hand corner. And then I'm gonna pick this to be the upper right-hand corner. And this is one of the reasons why it's a little difficult that we don't have another box down here that helps us register that edge. Or what would be easier is this line continue all the way to the bottom of our cross section to allow us an easier geo-reference. But all things considered, this should work out pretty fine. And again, this is just a guide. This is not an absolute thing. This is just our guide. I'm gonna zoom to cartographic lines. Snap this up top. Go ahead and grab this point and geo-reference this to here. And now we basically have it set up to go. The only thing that we could do is, you know, go ahead and geo-reference a couple points down here to then pull that down the rest of the way. We don't have to. This is a, entirely just an ability to get it set up for us to start. It's not a end-all be-all process. This is not an absolute thing. So what I'm going to go ahead and do is go ahead and rectify this raster so that we've saved it. As a raster. show that it's been rectified and go ahead and do a little bit of compression on it and say save. And the reason why I comment on building this in Excel or AI instead of a hand-drawn version is that we know in Excel all of these will be square and then in AI it's a little easier to make these things square as well. So now we can go ahead and remove that. Come to our catalog, come to Selden Canyon. Rasters and add in our rectified image. So now we have everything set up and we can uh, do some basic uh, looking at this now to see where we're at with things. So we can go ahead and take a measurement and take a look at, no, wrong tool. We could take a measurement and see how wide like this age box is. Yeah, it's a little short. It's more like that. It should be this wide. Again, 304.8 or 1,000 feet is a half an inch at 1 to 24K. So it looks like the boxes are mostly pretty close to that 304.8. A little wide, but that's not that big of a deal. But now we can really go ahead and just set up our boxes to create. And I recommend um, setting up some grids to begin with that help us align that. So using this line as our age is fine, but we can actually just put the age ticks here along this, and this gives us a buffer to put that in. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and create a temporary leader that is, again, I'm gonna do an absolute XY. My absolute X is 304.8. And I'm gonna go ahead and set it up at the top of that. So that sets my first point. And then now I can just do Control A or right click direction set it to 180, and then I can snap it directly to that. And then we can do the multiples. So again, make another one that's absolute 609.6 at that 10, 3.2. Zoom out, throw a directional. 
And now very quickly, we've kind of gridded out this. And it, you could also do it with the fishnet tool if you wanted to really build a fishnet of all of your settings. So the fishnet tool is one of the tools that you can just designate that you want it every uh, 304.8 meters. And it'll go ahead and make boxes that are then half an inch wide at 1 to 24K. Um, but one of the other reasons why I talk about these leaders is if the bottom of your Holocene is right here at that... Uh, age limit and you've built this scaled correctly you could use this then as a marker for that so i'm going to go ahead and place a point right here at that age again zoom out throw a directional and snap to and we can see that this image was digitized just a little wonky the 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 units are widening as they go further to the right. So this is one of the ways that we can avoid some of those types of issues. And then if you had a heading, let's say this wasn't angular unconformity, this was a heading for these units right here. In order to get things to align to that, you could throw a directional from the corner of that box to the top, set it to where it's double width or whatever. Throw another directional. And now we have two box widths here. Now we need three clearly, so I did that wrong, but you get the concept. And then we have a heading that we can set up here that aligns our units that are nested within that heading underneath it. Okay, so mostly I wanted to talk about getting this set up and configured to digitize. There are some specifics now that I'd like to cover. Let me let me let me pause for a second. Does anybody have any questions on why I'm setting up the leaders and the box and getting the grid aligned for getting ready to digitize? Does that process makes sense. One of the other things that I do is I'll typically go ahead and make my symbology for oops that leader that I'm using something obvious that will allow me when I start digitizing the boxes to see that I've closed all of my boxes. Another way you can do that is just set your contacts above that. Um, so that as we, as we digitize boxes, the grids, the, our alignment lines, our alignment tools are underneath. So as we make our boxes, those will be obscured by our contacts. Okay, so some of the specifics I wanted to talk about now. Um, and that's not specifics to this correlation of map units, because from here, everyone should basically be able to see how to then start digitizing the correlation of map units, right? We would come in, we'd pick our contact, we'd go ahead and we'd make a box. And with those grids, it really makes it easy to snap to our boxes. I have a midpoint here. If you've got midpoint snapping that's turned on, so if you wanted to bisect a unit, you can just very quickly go through and get everything built once you have your grid set up. And you don't have to worry about, you know, doing delta X, doing delta Y. You can just click and draw because you've done all the setup. You could do this any number of ways. You could just numerically start putting in your boxes. There's nothing wrong with that. You can also use the rectangle tool. There's nothing wrong with that either. So if you know you've got a box that's shaped like this, you could just use the rectangle tool and then use the line tool to set up your intersecting things. 
So don't just assume that you have to draw lines for this. You can easily come in and draw your rectangles. But with the grid set up so that things are in alignment, you kind of have everything at your disposal right from the get-go using either of these two tools. It doesn't matter which one you pick. The comment I am going to make is do not use the freehand tool. Please never use the freehand tool. Um, we can go into the details of that if you want, but it just creates problems um, that you won't recognize initially, and then you'll run topology and you'll have all the errors ever. Um, so some of the specifics I wanted to talk about. If you have an age that's a heading, make sure you make a box for it and make sure that you have a description for it in the description of map units that's designated as a heading because then this becomes a heading just like if we called this heading something else we'd want a box for it as well so if you physically make a box for it in the correlation of map units a polygon for it sorry a polygon for it in the correlation of map units we then have a physical feature that the DMU data table can join to that will then populate the description of map units legend. So if you have any headings, give yourself a CMU polygon representing that heading. And it may not always be the easiest thing to do, but if you can clearly set it up to where there's a, a strategic column for things. So if you had all of your... Um, I'm going to do the most generic thing in the world here. Let's just do it this way because it'll be fun and very basic. But let's say we have all our sediment sedimentary units, we have all of our igneous units, and we have all of our metamorphic units. And those were the headings, setting, uh, sedimentary, uh, igneous, and metamorphic. And then all of those were set up. You could then have your DMU reflect that sedimentary units and then have all of the sedimentary units listed. And then uh, you could then break it out by age. So sedimentary would be your heading one, and then the age would be your, setting, your heading two. Or you could do this the other way. Age would be heading one, and then sedimentary would be heading two. Either of those options can be done. But like I say, if you have a physical heading that you want on the legend, if you can format it in such a way that a box, a, a polygon can be built then it can dynamically be added without any effort whatsoever. So one of the things that we've seen commonly happen is someone decides that there needs to be a heading in the, in the description of map units data table, and there isn't a physical box or a physical way we can show that heading, we then zoom way out off the map and make a box over here. We fake a box to make a description entry in the description of map units that we then join to so this box will drive the population of the legend in ArcMap. This is one of the cheater ways that we can build your description of map units legend as you see fit. And this is kind of why I'm going into the discussion of if you can make a heading box be a physical polygon in the correlation of map units, so much of your work is done when it comes to building the legend then. So I hope that that helps clarify some things. Now, I kind of gave you the overview of the different ways you can draw boxes. You can do all sorts of different things. You can use the rectangle tool. There's many options for you in doing delta x, y if you've already got a line drawn. You can set up an absolute point if you know where that is. One of the other things to keep in mind, if you snap to one of these, and let's say right click absolute, since it's snapped, that is the exact number that it needs to be at. If all you're doing is changing your x position along that, then all you need to do is type in your x position along that. Um, if you have set intervals for these, you could go ahead and digitize in a temporary line that is that interval as well. And if you know what that is, it's very easy to click on the end of your 304.8 box and then 
digitize, click your point, and then do a delta x, delta y, because it will only move however many units over, and uh, your y value will always be zero because we're not moving up and down. And if you were creating a vertical marker box that was spaced between units, it's the same exact concept. If you're locked into your delta x, your delta, if you use the delta x y tool, your delta x is zero, and then all you're doing is altering your vertical distance. Um, I think that is a good, it's a lot of information, but I think that's a good foundation for those of you that are, you know, familiar with having done this before. Uh, it might have given you another way of thinking of this or another way of helping build on this. And I think for those of you that have never digitized a correlation to map uh, units before, this gives you the foundation of what to look at and what to look for. And kind of the key take homes is set you up with an area to start digitizing in. Set you up an area to start digitizing in. Give yourself a, found, a fundamental location that is specified for the space that is allotted on your map. That will give you the best start for this. And like Sanir asked earlier, could we do this horizontal? Absolutely. Um, keep in mind that the space we have available in our current template is this size. This is what we have available. So if you can make it any smaller, that might mean that we can use your full descriptions on the layout or have more than one cross section on the layout. Um, we try and make this branded to the bureau style that we've been creating for decades now as much as possible. And when I first came in, that was one of the first things I did was unify a lot of the elements on the map as being the default and trying to make it consistent because I noticed they would alter just a little bit. So uh, in doing that, one of the things that we did set up was making space for the cross section and making space for the correlation to map units. And so far, this mostly works. There are a few exceptions where this doesn't work. But in general, this area is almost always more than enough for being able to group the units together. Um, if need be, and uh, you have a lot of uh, syndepositional units, you could rotate it just like Sinir asked, make it a portrait or landscape instead of portrait. And then what that means is your vertical scale then has to get squished. So it might be easier to go ahead and make this horizontal uh, landscape view uh, because then all you're doing is squishing your uh, deposition period, um, if you will. Are there any questions on the generics or some of the specifics that you're encountering on the correlation of map units? Okay, and then to keep progressing with this, the um, correlation of map unit points, correlation of map unit, map unit points, feature class has features set up for what they physically represent. So if you have an age unit, you can easily come in here, set your age, come to your attribute table, Oops, uh, that's going to not be happy because it can only be, Amy, do you remember, is that 12 units long? I thought it was 10. 10 units long. So Holocene, well, you have to keep in mind that map unit is meant to be very short. It's meant to be just an identifier to join to your description of map units, whereas the label is the full label. And then the symbol, ah, is that. If you have any notes, 
enter in your specific data source ID, and then it will work to functionally label these things as designed and set up. So if you have a whole bunch of ages that you want to put in, you can put the ages in, Eon, Epic, Eras, headings. So again, if this was my sedimentary heading, I'd click a box, I'd make a box and then click my heading and then I'd call this SEDS or something like that. Label this as sedimentary. And then the heading is what it labels. So it will coordinate the label of labeling of it. Okay, so currently you have 10 units for map unit. We're gonna try and unify that because it looks like it has been altered, but should be 10 units. Uh, 10 characters, sorry, 10 characters. <laughs> Text is not units, Phil. Um, uh, don't forget that, you know, identity confidence. For a heading, it would be high. For the Holocene, it would be high. For your units and the correlation of map units, those are probably all high unless you have some reason why you're waffling on what it is. But likely... Um, in here, you should have no questionable units, right? And that's what that would represent. And then for your map units, you would come to the map unit tab, uh, map unit point, and then just go ahead and click here. And this is where this becomes really handy to switch back and forth like I have, because this would be QVY, QVY, QVY. DSPLM, and if you had set all of the templates up from the beginning with your data source ID, you'll never have to type that in again. So now we have that entered, and our confidence is high. And then right away, we could just go right on to the next one. So you can click, and this would be QVYF. and then so on and so forth. So with regard to the things that are likely to be on a correlation of map unit, it's pretty obvious just by doing a couple of them that likely your identity confidence will be high and your data source will not be changing, right? So what you may want to do every time you start working with a new correlation of map units layer file is come into all of these and alter them all at once. So in order to do that, we go to the organized templates. In the organized templates, I'm going to come to my map unit points. I'm going to select properties. Oops, dang it. Select all, select properties. And now, because our identity confidence for all of them is high, and our data source is DSPLM, I've changed that alteration now for every single one of them so that that is a default value just like the P type was a default value. Uh, just to be aware that the P type is going to go away and it's just going to be called the type field. Uh, this is a uh, hangover from uh, the Bureau's hybrid model from almost a decade ago now. <laughs> right, and high, as I uh, was just pointed out to me, is lowercase. And this is a huge designation. So if it is a um, if it's a proper noun, make sure it's capitalized. High is not a proper noun, so it needs to be lowercase. And everyone asks, why does that matter? And it's because the identity confidence and the P type are related to our glossary. 
And for the glossary to actually work, they have to be spelled exactly the same and have the same capitalization. So thank you for reminding me on that. That's a problem that I have. I want to capitalize everything uh, in a table. I don't know why, but I do. Um, but because it's a term that isn't a proper noun, the term would not be capitalized. Therefore, we need to make sure that we enter it in not capitalized. So, um, the same can be done for all of your contacts and faults as well. So again, select the lines, come to your line type, and set the values. Are these concealed in the correlation of map units? No, they're not, but they're also fictional. This is one of the things that we're talking about currently in the amongst our group to see if there's things that we can alter. Uh, this would be certain. This would be certain. So you can see how you can change the default properties for all of these in one foul swoop. Um, Wait, Phil? Yeah. What do you mean by change that is concealed? Like, it, it Sorry, what, Steer? Could you speak up or get closer to the mic? Yeah, sure. Uh, can you hear me better? Yes. Okay. Uh, did you mean like getting rid of the is talking about changing things or talking about getting rid of the is concealed field and putting it in the existence zone or something? You were talking about changing, you were discussing changing things. Never mind. It's not important right now. It's all good. Okay. So, in the template properties, we're not changing any attribute table information. This is just changing the default values for the entries that we put into the template so that when you digitize, there's less that you have to enter every time when you make a new feature from your create features template. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it's, it's all good. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to say this. You say yes, but it sounds like I didn't answer your question. So what is your question? Can you ask it again? Uh, no, I was just trying to, I, I was just asking to clarify what you meant, and now I understand, so it's all good. Don't, don't worry about it. It's not an important issue. It's all good. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Um. Yeah, I'm, I can't help but feel like I didn't actually answer your question. But um, with regard to then the ages, the numeric ages, we have a physical point here that is uh, the numeric age. And this is set up in a way that you can go ahead and match this. So if this is... a uh, 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 um, sorry, match is not the right term, align with the ages of your boxes. Uh, so what we would do here is very basic. So we'd come to here, because the scale says it's 0 MA, we can come to our attribute and type in the label as 0 MA. And then here, since our scale is always MA on this, we don't ever need to type that again except for the last one. So we'd come, and again, likely because I made my grid, I can snap right to that point, type in 0 0.0117. Again, if I had my grid, snap right to my grid, 2.58. And then at the very bottom, come all the way down to the bottom, find where our Precambrian end is, or what we're calling the end, or at least the start of the Precambrian, and then go ahead and put in our age for that, and go ahead and do an MA again, so that top and bottom are capped. If there's any scale changes along the length of this, like say we go from uh, 
thousand years, and then right here we jump our scale. Yeah, right here we jump our scale from thousand years to million years. You'd want to put a Ka and an Ma right across from each other. So that again, we bracket the top and the bottom of that scale and then enter in the top and bottom of our next scale. Yeah, okay. So I think that basically gives us the information we want. And then as we're done with this, we can start turning off our things to see what we've got digitized. And then it'll give us an idea of where we're at with things. And we can see that the dynamic labels are now happening physically by the features we've created. When we do polygons from these points, then, oh, we missed a box. Oh, okay. So this is one of the things that you can do on a regular basis to just get an idea of where you're at with things. One of the other things that I find convenient is to go ahead and make the raster that you're digitizing from be somewhat transparent. It'll allow your physical features that you're drawing to stand out a little bit better. Okay, I think that covers, oh, um, one other thing. Uh, we don't need a heading up here, so you don't need a box up here. We do data-driven layouts. So again, the data will come from this. And on the layout, we'll make the data frame name populate this right here. And because this is Selden Canyon, the layout will say it's Selden Canyon, so you wouldn't need that. I understand it's done as a byproduct of being a standalone figure. Um, but just wanted to talk about that in terms of things, uh, of what we will use. And then one of the, oops. Uh, if they are sin depositional and they interfinger or interrelate, no space, right? So Jacob asked, um, what is the preferred distance between sin depositional units? If they truly are sin depositional and they interact with each other, you'll want to show that interfingering relationship. So that's where you can do things like this or do your jagged little uh, interfingering right here. Um, you know, prograde and uh, retro, uh, ret not retrograde. Uh, transgression regression stuff. I understand that's quaternary. You can ignore me on that. But uh, transgression regression stuff, you could show that long-term uh, periodicity. Um, as far as the gap between them, uh, between syndepositional units that are not uh, separated by contacts, that do not abut one each other, either through a buttress or something like that, um, I don't know that we have a designated width. I would kind of say, well, how many units do you have across? Take the width of 304.8 times however many you have. Take the extra number that you have, divide by the extra width that you have, divide by that number, and that would then evenly space it. I tend to be a mathematical approach to things. Um, that would be my suggestion, but it doesn't have to be that way. Uh, but, you know, uh, if we think that every box is a half inch wide, maybe an eighth of an inch, something like that. I, I mean, I, I'm not going to give any hard and fast rules on that one because uh, I don't want to lock everyone into thinking a very specific way except for the things that really matter. So in terms of, you know, the spacing between syndepositional units, I'm not going to specify, but keep it consistent. That will be my, always, my take-home message will be keep it consistent. I think that is my large take-home message with how you do everything in here, is if you do it consistently, it'll be easier to deal with uh as for posterity and for the layout phase when we get there. Are there any other questions? Are there any comments? Okay. 
So I think for the most part that covers the things that I think are a good foundation for um, getting set up with giving you the strongest uh, uh, starting point for digitizing these things. And again, uh, Jacob had a comment earlier in a separate email that was talking about the unconformal having the line through it. Uh, can he remove it? I wouldn't worry about it. We, we, this is all cartographic stuff. What I care about is that you capture your geology correct. We'll deal with the cartographic stuff on the end. If you can get your geology correct, that's less questions that we'll have later on. So don't worry about the cartography. It, just, just put that out of your mind. Get the geology correct. And then we can deal with any of the weird interactions that happen after the fact. And yeah, this symbol with the line through it has been an issue for a while. Um, it, it's, it's so low on the order of priorities of things that we're dealing with um, that you'll see on any layout, we have dealt with this when we go to the layout phase. Uh, in the GIS, this is a byproduct of the fact that we're using the FGDC um, uh, Digital Cartographic Standards for Geologic Maps book that this was set up when that book came out years ago and we just haven't dealt with it because it's uh, again it's such a low priority in the grand scheme of things so yeah i hope that clears that up and makes that um put your trust in us for cartography we will do you right we will absolutely make sure it's done right um yeah any other questions, comments, or concerns? Any other topics you'd like me to touch on in the future? Because I do think I'm going to come back to the cross-section again. I think I'd like to go through that procedure from beginning to end and get one video with it done right. Cool. Um, there is a description of map units data table uh, video already up on my YouTube channel. So if you just Google uh, Phil L. Miller or Phil Miller GIS, uh, it'll show up on there. And uh, it basically has uh, an outdated method for entering into the DMU, but it's not horrible. It'll give you an idea. Uh, I am planning on redoing that video as well. And... Um, especially because the uh, geomaterials dictionary entry information has changed. So I want to modify that video, but it'll be easier if I just reshoot the video altogether. Um, so that's in the works. So a CMU or a cross-section video and a um, DMU, updated DMU video are in the works uh, soon. And those are the main ones that I can think of. Cause I think most of the other videos that I have information on are sort of usurped and need to just be thrown away and done all over again as well. But those are the ones that I have high on my priority list for getting done. So if there's nothing else, um, thank you all. I appreciate it. And I'll get this cut together and uploaded soon. Thank you, Phil. Not a problem. Really appreciate it. Yeah, I'm happy to do this. It, it's actually one of the easier things to do is get people together and go ahead and go through and work through things and let everyone ask questions and knock them out right then when we're in the middle of it. All right. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you.